sing of his wonderful mercy to me. I'll praise him till all men his goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. I'm sure that every one of us that are saved tonight, it puts something in our heart to tell somebody else about this glorious salvation and what God has done for us. Let's sing the last verse like you really mean it. Everybody, I'll sing of his wonderful mercy to me. I'll praise him to all his goodness to me. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad. Till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. He brought me out of the fiery land. He took the day of the Lord to save me. All his love to save me. again tonight, our Sister Brown. God bless you, Sister Brown, as you minister to us. You know, scolding does us good sometimes, doesn't it? We, uh, we like rather to be patted on the back a little. But it's nice when the Lord touches us, isn't it? I'm very grateful for the Lord's touch in these services. I said this afternoon, anybody that couldn't bring forth a message in the atmosphere that was here, it would be something wrong with them. And I thank God for the beautiful atmosphere that is the Spirit of the Lord is so manifest. And when He's manifest, Everyone is blessed. Yes, Maybe blessed with deep convictions for something, but you're blessed. You know, sometimes we think blessing only comes when we're just hilarious, but you know, there's another kind too. And we thank God for them all, don't we? Praise be to His name. I'm going to speak a little tonight. I feel the Lord would have me. From the third chapter of First Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye could not, you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye now able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy, strife, division, are ye not carnal, 
and walk as men. For where one says, I am Paul, and another, I am Cephas, of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he that watereth, he that planteth, nor anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We don't think that often, do we? And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, with God. Ye are God's husbandry, or God's tilled land. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto us, as wise master builders, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build on this foundation gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, so is by fire. I want to talk tonight, I feel the Spirit is leading on what we build on this foundation, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul has given us here two kinds. The first working that might be laid after the foundation has been laid. Jesus Christ our foundation for no building can be erected, no character, for we are God's building, without this foundation first. Sometimes people try, you know, to build something, try to make a uh, character, try to... I remember a Christian science friend that I had for many years. I just lived with us, lived the next door, and was quite a friendly, and they were. And uh, she was always saying that the only way to and of course they don't believe in the blood of Jesus Christ as the Savior, the world, for there is no sin according to them, and no devil, so of course you have no devil, you have no sin. And so I would tell her, well, I, you may try to have patience, and oh, how she would try to show me how that you could live without all of this trying to be a Christian. But I found one day that she slipped. She slipped pretty far, too. So I said to her, what's the matter with you now? Your foundation's gone, hasn't it? Oh, she says, that was a bad one. But I said, if you'd had my Jesus, you wouldn't have went so far down. She says, well, I don't know about that. I know. I know. You see, you were on a sliding board. And it was pretty slippery. When you come to that place of where you went, you know there's only one foundation. Hallelujah. You got that foundation, you can begin to build a character for Jesus Christ. Now he says here that we are God's tilled land and we are God's husbandry and we are God's building. We are God's tilled land and we are God's building. Those two mean a great deal to 
to build characters. Amen. Tilled land. You know what that is? You're farmers. We're all farmers. I, I'm a farmer because I have a garden once in a while, but it has to be in the in a in the window box. But it's a garden. <laughs> I plant seed and I have to rake that up and get all out. I know what it means. They have to put in some fertilizer. So that's farming. Is that good farming? <laughs> now, if we're God's tilled land, land that's broken, land that's been all plowed up, and that Adam, it's only then ready for the seed. But when there is no tilled land, it becomes very hard. Break up the sour ground. That's what it is. And only a plow, and that has to be pretty sharp too, can go in and break up that sour ground. Break it up, turn it over. Well, if the ground could speak, perhaps sometimes it would say, don't bring that old plow in here. I don't want to be turned upside down, but that's what you're being doing right now, if you're God's tilled land. God's working on you to plant some real seed into your land. Now, what kind of seed is he going to sow? What kind of a building is he going to have? We are not only God's tilled land, but we are God's building. Now, in that building, he says, we can build upon this foundation gold. I'm glad he put that first. It really is something, isn't it? Gold means in the scriptures divinity, divine. If I begin to build upon the foundation Jesus Christ, it must be divine. It must be gold if it's going to be built. Amen. If it's going to last, it must be something that's real. That character, that divine life of God, that the Holy Spirit has come into our lives to make manifest the life of Jesus. Paul tells us in that fourth of Corinthians, that's the one reason, the only one reason that you go through the trials and tests and the hard places is to bring you out gold. Gold. You'd never been in that furnace if it hadn't been the dross that's in you. No, we wouldn't have had to go on through, but there's so much dross in us. We have to get into the fire to get it out. Because we're building gold upon our foundation. And it's got to be pure gold, divine gold. Oh, that character of Jesus. Purity, holiness. That's the foundation of gold, gold. And then he says he can build gold and silver, redemption, and costly stone. <coughs> costly stone. You know, a building that's made real upon such a foundation is a costly building. It's very costly. We can see some of these great buildings that are putting up. The foundations have to go very, very deep. Paul, the higher you go, the deeper down you have to go. That's what they tell me, the carpenters, they just they say. You have to go way down in some of these skyscrapers in New York. They say you have to go down, 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 down if you're going to go up, up, up. It's the same with you and I. If we're going to go up, 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 we've got to go down, down, down. And if we get far enough down, we probably can get a little higher up. But our trouble is we don't like to go down. <laughs> oh, my, that's the hardest thing in the world is to go down. You know who's the hardest people in the world to humble themselves? You know? Pentecostal people. 
That's right, brother. They're cutting off the people the hardest people to go down. Amen. They are so proud of their experience, and uh, they wouldn't want you to know that they'd failed. Oh, no. I'm sanctified holy, and I'm sitting here, and I got everything, and they're lacking most everything. <laughs> and unwilling to pay, unwilling to say, Lord, have mercy on me. God's going to help us. Oh, I tell you, brother. Costly stones. On this foundation. <laughs> I was thinking today, or this evening when I was sitting there, what would be the costly stone? And I thought of those wonderful stones. <coughs> Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. They're costly. They're not on the surface ground. No. You never have the fruit of the Spirit on a life that lives on the surface. Never. Amen. That fruit is costly. Yes. The fruit of the Spirit is costly. It'll cost you everything you've got to have divine love. Love. I, I don't mean, Brother Brown used to say this, pompy, pompy love. I don't mean that kind of thing, he'd say. And I'd say the same. Amen. But divine love is something that's strong. Amen. Something that's Amen. stable. Amen. Something that can take a thing as well as give it. Love for his season. Divine love, this costly stone is full of compassion, full of compassion. Oh, I marked one day in my Bible, all through the New Testament, where the Lord said, the heart of compassion. He had compassion, compassion. Go through sometimes and mark your Bible in some of those great, great <laughs> words. Oh, compassion, compassion. He looked upon the multitudes and saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He had such compassion for them. Shepherds that were real shepherds, that cared for the sheep, what he was speaking of. They were the kind. And he had compassion because they didn't have any shepherds like that. The shepherds would run as they saw the hiring coming. Run! Or go away to get out of it someplace. But oh, the love. The divine love has compassion. It has compassion. I feel sometimes that we who've had the Holy Spirit and His mighty anointing and His divine presence living within us to think we haven't compassion. We haven't very much compassion. When we own up to it, no. Oh, I love this brother because he loves me. I love this sister because she loves me. And well, glory to God, hallelujah. But how about that poor soul over there? How about that brother there? We just love one another because they love us. And because they pat us on the back, we pat them. And that's as far as we go. But that's not love. No. Cost you more than that, brother. It'll cost you something to have divine love. It's the lamb slave. It's the lamb slave that brings the divine touch that gives to us the divine love. Yes. And so this stone is very costly. <clears throat> Gold, silver, costly stone. Joy. Well, sometimes when we look upon joy, we don't think that's such a costly a jewel. That stone doesn't mean so awfully much. Oh, hallelujah, I'm praise the Lord. I just thought joy. Not that kind. That's all right. That's good, too. I like it. I'm a great person to laugh myself. I like to laugh. Helps you make you go fast. <laughs> <laughs> but love, but joy that God speaks of is the joy that Jesus said. My joy 
I lead with you. My joy I give unto you. My peace to you. My joy. What was Jesus' joy? The joy of Jesus, the deepest joy of the heart of the Son of God, was that those disciples that he called and set apart might know of this fellowship with him. Amen. That they might enter into that place with the Master himself, a joy not on the surface, a joy when our Lord, when the, in the fourth chapter, when the woman at the well had gone into the city, you remember, the disciples came back, and they asked the Master to eat, they had something, and he said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. That was his joy. There was that whole village, and that souls were going to come and be saved. That was his joy. That wasn't the joy of having a feast. That wasn't the joy of even having a time with, the, with his own disciples in partaking of food. No. Joy that's real is the joy that you can have in the midst of a trial, in the midst of a test, in the midst of a storm. There's a something there in real joy that oh, no. helps you to praise the Lord. And praise the Lord not in words. We had a janitor one time, and you know how it is with people in the church and some say, Oh, my devil, how do you put down the window? So they put down the window. And someone says, Oh, it's too cold. Put up the window. So he was uh, p- putting it up and down. Honey, he said, Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> he was so mad, you know, but he didn't want to curse, so he said, Glory to God. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes we say that kind of joy. We say it, you know, and there is something inside. And, and we are, but this joy that I'm telling you about is something that keeps you in the hour of trial. Something keeps you in the hour of temptation. Gives you something there. Glory that comes out, and it isn't sounding like uh, sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. It doesn't sound like that, but it sounds like a great roar. Oh, oh, hallelujah. I heard it here yesterday, last night. I heard it here tonight. That great rolling out of worship and praise to God. It really has a ring to it, doesn't it? It has a real something to it. Well, that's one of those precious stones that's in this building of character. We are God's building. You have a foundation of Jesus Christ. You have been redeemed by the silver. You know, over there in the song of songs, I was just thinking of it tonight as I was sitting there, and I marked it down here. You remember that portion of the scripture? This here chariot that belongs to the bride. <laughs> Glory. He made the pillars there all the silver. Redemption. This chariot that we're going up in is redemption. And the bottom thereof of gold. Hallelujah. That's a good foundation. Divine, mighty power of God. And the covering thereof is purple. And in the midst of it, it was paved with love. I'm going up in that chariot. How about you? That's the one I want to go up in. That chariot. It has its pillars of silver. It holds up this character, this building, because it's redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Its foundation, its bottom is gold, the divine life of the Son of God. And then these precious stones, these costly stones, that peace, that beautiful stone of peace, Oh, what colors are in that? There's all the colors of the rainbow in that piece, in that costly stone. You know what it costs you to have peace? A consecrated life, a whole burnt offering on God's altar. Without it, it's impossible to have this choice stone in your building. Peace is a marvelous thing. I don't always have it. I, I, I confess it. I get troubled too sometimes. Some of these ministers, of course, never get troubled, but I do sometimes. 
You do too, don't you? Yes, you do. You own up to it. Well, we do get troubles. And in the midst of it, something about that peace again, whirling around. We just wonder what's going to happen. Oh, God, we find ourselves crying out, Lord, that constant quietness within. In quietness, you said it. And in confidence, we can have peace. But here I'm disturbed by this condition. I'm disturbed by these things that have come. What shall I do? What does it mean? Is it going to be a break in my foundation, in my character, in my life of building? No. Hallelujah. Jesus is right there. The Holy Spirit is right there. He's come within. And he's there to meet every emergency. He's there to meet every test, every trial. And if you and I will recognize him and really depend on him, he'll do it. He waits to do it. He longs to do it. You don't mind if I take off that hat, do you? I, I sometimes, you know, it don't stick on very good. Well, it's that very thing. It's that something that God longs to make living and real in us. Oh, peace, peace, wonderful peace. When those disciples were so tested at Jesus asleep in the boat, Master, Master, we're perishing. Oh, how calm the Son of God arose. Troubled disciples. He says, what's the matter? Where is your faith? Have you no faith? Not believing? And he just reached out and said, peace. Peace to these troubled waters. Oh, how many times we can say how many times in the power of the Holy Ghost you have said it? How many times God has given us that great and mighty power in the midst of things to say, peace, peace, and it comes. That's a wonderful, wonderful, but it's costly. It's costly stone. All these are very costly stones. You have to dig deep to get them. They're way down. Long suffering. My, what a precious stone that is. Costly, too. We're so impatient, aren't we? We don't let the Holy Ghost speak to our hearts very often because we don't give him time. We rush into that sacred chamber. We fall down and we pour out a prayer quickly. What time is it? Oh, I must go. Well, Lord, amen, Lord. You help me today. Yes, I must be on the job. Off we go. We don't give. We meet somebody that's very needy today. But we haven't spent enough time with him in the chamber to be really long-suffering. Long-suffering with that one. Patient. Willing to help them. <coughs> oh, I think that's one of the most beautiful stones in the whole character. It's long suffering. We say, well, I'll just do it now. This brother doesn't do it now. That sister don't come now. Well, I'll just put that at the end of it. Long suffering. If the pastor had dealt that with you and I, we'd never be here tonight, would we? No, no, we would not. But thank God for the Holy Spirit's fruit. It's his fruit. And he longs to make it manifest in us. And if you will let him, he'll give you patience. He'll give you long suffering. Then gentleness. That's a precious stone. Gentleness. Meekness, they're wonderful stones, aren't they? The Bible says that Moses was the meekest man that lived. And as we follow this man and see what he went through, oftentimes we don't wonder. Long suffering, there was a time he didn't have too long suffering, but all the other piled up to make that a character, a most marvelous character. We take Joseph, 
the iron into his very soul and his being. There he was. His life was such that could be said nothing, but he felt the grind in that prison. In that dungeon, he felt it when he had been the means of interpreting the dream for the butler. And he said to him, don't forget me when you get out. You go to Pato and tell him, I'm here. I'm, I shouldn't be in this prison. There's nothing. I did nothing to be here. Well, you see, Joseph needed another year. Yeah. He hadn't come down. You know, when you and I try to bring things about ourselves, generally the other fellows forget us. And the Lord will let him forget it, too. I've sometimes had people forget. I said, well, I wonder what in the world did they... God let them forget it because it wasn't time. You're going through a place and you think somebody's going to help you out, but he don't help you and he really forgets all about it. Why didn't you? Oh, I forgot, brother. Well, how could he forget when I was going through such a test? When I was having such a hard time, how could anybody forget? Well, God let him forget it. So to take you through, you would have never gone through. You'd have never had what you have today if somebody else had pulled you through. If you go through, if you let the Holy Ghost take you through, and you stand true to him and not lean on somebody else, that's why so many Christians are really weaklings today. Amen. Somebody else got to pray them through. Somebody else got to do this. Somebody else got to do that for them. They can't stand on their own. Amen. That's kind of cross, I guess, but I don't mean it cross. I pray for every one of you. I pray for them all the time. When you see divine healing life, you see the same cross. Come and come and come and come and come. The same one for all the time. One didn't pray to the last man was healed. They didn't pray and keep up ahead. And so they come the next time in the same line again. Well, I thought you were healed. Well, I was touched, but you know I'm sick again. They will be all the time. That class will never get healed. Isn't that good news? <laughs> because God is longing to do something for you. You! Establish you! Establish you! And if you're going to lead on somebody else for your prayers and for your deliverance, brother, you'll never know the real power of God. You'll never know the deep fellowship of the Spirit until you are willing to get into your own closet and fast and pray for yourself. Amen. Amen. Take it now in love, because this chariot of mine is love. Amen. Amen. I often have said in our, we used to give one night of, in our campaigns, one night for divine healing. And I believe, of course, I do know it's, uh, it's the word of God. And, and I believe in it. Of course, I've been healed a multitude of times. I was healed of TB when I was a young girl. And... Uh, I know what it is, and I know divine healing is God's word, and I know that anyone that trusts him can be healed, except God's taking you through. Miss Sisson, I think some of you remember Miss Sisson. Maybe you're not old enough for that, but anyway, she was this up in my day. And she was a very deeply consecrated woman. She's had many books uh, written, and she's really very... She was in our place, and... Uh, at those early days, of course, we believed in divine healing and you never took a thing, not even, even a, a hot water bottle, I was going to say, or anything else. You just trusted God. So I, uh, she was saying that she had a uh, divine healing for many years and she didn't know. She says, well, I uh, had to go to the doctor. I said, Daddy, you had to go to the doctor. She said, yes, you know, the Lord sent me. I said, oh, the Lord, poor Lord, you're laying it all on him. <laughs> and she said, no, Sister Brown, I had, the Lord told me. Well, of course, I didn't believe it, see. I thought that she was just taking that. And she said, you know, all my life, and she was about, 
Oh, I just then she must have been uh, about 65. She says, oh, she was a missionary in India until she was, was over 65 because she couldn't go back. She was, had, uh, was retired. And she said, well, all my life, even in India, I never took, what is it they take uh, for fevers? Uh, not aspirin. What is it? Huh? Why not? She said, I never even took that. Not once while I was in India. I trusted God absolutely. And I have never had a doctor in my life. But she says, you know, what God showed me, I was proud of my never having a doctor. I was proud that I could say that I never did this and I never did that and I never. And when I would see others, I... But failing along that line, I'd say, oh, God help them. How they're failing the Lord. And she says, the Lord spoke to me. And she was very, very close to God, this woman. She says, God spoke to me. He says, I want you to go to the doctor. She had something matter with her foot. I want you to go to the doctor and show him that foot. She said, for days, she wouldn't go. And finally, she said, well, Lord, is it really you talking to me? How can I go to a doctor after all these years of witnessing uh, against doctors and against these things? How can I go? And the Lord said, humble yourself. I want to break that strong something in you. And so she said, she went to the doctor. He fixed up her foot. And she said, I'm all right. I said, really, did you keep the touch of God on your soul while you're doing it? <laughs> yes, she said, I came out more than a conqueror. Well, I had to get down to pray. I said, Lord, I can't understand this. Here's your word and here's that. And then I realized in my own heart, not that I went to any doctor, but I realized that we get strong spirits in ourselves. And we condemn someone else because they don't walk in our path. They haven't had our teaching, our learning, our place. And so we get a little feeling in there and talk to them and talk up to somebody else about them. Say this and that. And God is bringing us all down. And he's allowing us to go through some of the severest tests. God's Pentecostal people today are being tried and tested as never before. Never before. And they can go to divine healings after divine healings and come back the same. We've had them. Well, what did God do for you? Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I was at the end of the line because all he did for me was pass and go on. Well, I said, some got, when they passed on, got something. And you didn't get nothing? No, I spent all that money going way up there and all that it cost me. Well, I said, you see, if you'd have given that to the Lord, you, you probably wouldn't have had all that time. But you kept it, and you were stingy, and you held back God's power. You spent it going up there, and you see, you're no better. Confess your sin now. Get down. Let's get to God. And if you do, I'll take you now. Get in touch with God. Get in touch with God. God is building a character in you. And it takes all of these precious stones to make it a living reality. And it's costly. It's a costly life that you and I are living. It costs something to walk with God. Costly. King David said, you remember when God showed him that after numbering the children of Israel, and he Build an altar. The Lord told him to go and build an altar that the plate might be stayed. And when David went down to the threshing floor of Arona, he said to him, Can I have this floor? I'll buy it at the full price. And the king said, You can have it for nothing. And I'll give you the oxen and I'll give you the wood and I'll give you for everything. You don't have to pay, he said. Me? King David, do you think, he says, I would offer unto the Lord that which cost me nothing? That which cost me nothing. Many of God's Pentecostal children like the other fellow to pay the bill. And they keep theirs in their pocket. 
Well, you pay it. Well, uh, you can... Uh, I, I think it's good for that brother to sacrifice him. Why don't that sister give more? What about you? Cost you something. If you want a life and if you want an offer, an offering unto God, it'll cost you something. Cost something to offer unto God. Yes, it will. Cost you something. Oh, how God speaks to our hearts these days. How God is searching down to a depth in us such as we have never known. I have never known the deep searchings of God as I've known them in the past couple of three years. Never known them in this last year. Still deeper, still deeper. The real depth to know God's sacred will. To walk as we were singing in that song. To walk with God. To have the joy of the Lord. To have that something within our lives that counts for God and for eternity. We've had people come into the church that were not uh, uh, really in favor with Pentecost. For instance, there was a sister that wrote from the, uh, the radio, had been listening to us on the radio, and she wrote me a letter and she said, you know, when I was at the, uh, the Bible school there, she says, in New York, and I'd had a definite call to the Southern Field, but I'd always been warned about Pentecost. And when I, in the town where I lived, she said there was a Pentecostal uh, little assembly there. And because I'd been so warned it was the work of the devil and all, she said, I'd, when I'd go down that street, I'd go on the other side. Uh, that's when I'd be going by that uh, assembly, I might, the devil might come out. Well, she said, when I came here, she said, I had such a longing, I heard so much about black tidings. And I, but then I was warned, too, when I went that I should be careful, because Glad Tidings was a church, and, and uh, they, uh, they'll get you. Second or third time you go, they'll get you, so don't go. So she said, uh, I didn't go. The second year in school, and uh, she said, one day she had such a longing to go. So she said, I don't think it hurt me. I'm established enough. I think I'll go down. And I go into that church just to see for myself. She came down and she wrote this to me. And she came down and she said, as she did it, she entered the door and came in. Before she knew what she was saying, she said, out loud, she didn't realize that she was really in this. She said, why, God's in this place. I feel it. And she said, Sister Brown, God talked to me through your message that day, that afternoon, until I, before I knew it, was at that altar weeping my heart out to God. And after, when she went home, she said she went to that Pentecostal church. She didn't go on the other side. She walked in, and she said the very first time she came in there, she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on her way down to Africa. Well, I say, there it is, you see. Some people, uh, sometimes the very atmosphere, the very presence of God, Amen. when we are in the Spirit, like this afternoon, like tonight, someone will come in. Perhaps there's someone in here tonight that's never been in a Pentecostal church. And you just wondered at it. It is a little strange at first. It is a little strange. I was a little strange the first meeting I ever went into. And I heard them all praying together, and I, I didn't want to let them think I wasn't praying, but I was looking through my hands to see what it was all about everywhere like this. I couldn't understand how everybody could pray at once. I was used to having just the preacher pray. And I didn't understand everybody praising the Lord. But yet there was something that fed my soul. Amen. There was something in a hungry heart that longed for just that that thing which brought me back, and back, and back, hallelujah, oh, until I was filled with the Holy Ghost. And so it is in that if you and I can keep so in the Spirit, we keep God's presence in our assembly, keep God's presence in our own heart, bring in the blessing, not come always from it, bring it in with you, come prepared, prepared. I remember Brother Bauer used to say, when they had meetings, he'd always get up and say the first thing, now, he said, children of God, let no one speak in tongues today or give a message that hasn't been first with God. Let no one get up to interpret a message today that hasn't first talked to God. Amen. And I'm telling you, it went over the whole meeting. Because oftentimes, you know, when the spirit is like that, you feel just, ooh, you could get up and talk in tongues by the yard. But you see, that won't help. 
And so it was meaning to walk with God, keep close to God. Then when you've got an interpretation, and when you've got a tongue, it's the Spirit, the Spirit of God moving and coming down. It's costly. It's costly. It's costly. Hallelujah, though. God's waiting to make it a living reality. He longs to have these precious stones, these costly stones, made living and real in our temple. Hallelujah. Our temple, the temple that God is building, that patience, that stone is so precious. But it means so much because it is costly. It'll mean that oftentimes you can't have your own way and you can't answer back. That's kind of hard for some people. Of course, it isn't for you and I, but it's hard for the other fellow. We're all right, but he's impatient. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's impatient. Brother Brown and I, when we were first married, I'm going to tell you some this little funny thing. Why, he was a strong spirit, and so was I. <laughs> I wanted my way, and he wanted his way, you see. Well, I'd had that mission for about three years before he came in, and so I thought I ought to have something to say, too. So, <clears throat> one night, we... Uh, the meeting didn't go like he wanted it and didn't go like I wanted it. We both went home uh, walking, not saying a word. You don't know what that is, but of course I do. And so when I got home, uh, I thought, of course, you know, that we'd make up and, and he'd say that he was sorry. And then when he'd say he was sorry, I'd say I'm sorry. So we went to bed. I went in, he went, in, went into the bedroom. And so I thought, well, I got down and prayed. So I prayed a while and prayed. I thought, well, I wonder why he don't come out <laughs> But he didn't come. So after a while, I said, well, Lord, I'll take grace and go in. Glory to God. Always means that the woman has to bend it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in. <laughs> Whoa, behold, if he wasn't asleep, he'd never time to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came back and I said, oh, God, how can he sleep with that spirit? <laughs> that I have never had in my whole Christian experience, baptism and all, God begins there to deal with that strong spirit. God began to break that strong spirit. And I, after a while, went to bed. He was Brother Brown was working then. He was head engineer. Next morning, I got up to get the breakfast. I thought, well, <laughs> he'd probably say, well, did you <laughs> I thought he'd make some apology. <laughs> but I had the victory, so I didn't care whether he did or not, but I kind of thought he would, see. For his own sake, see, we think. So I got breakfast, his rolls, it's nice, it's convenient, it's the same as though nothing has ever happened. Now, at night I said to him, I have the victory, but I said, how could you go to sleep without the victory? I had the victory, he said. <laughs> well, I said, that's the victory. I don't know. <laughs> but he had the victory. I guess he did. 
But those are the things that God is working on in us. And if we are willing for God to work and not see the other one, but see, and it takes the Holy Ghost to show you yourself, it takes the Holy Ghost to come down and really, and he can never show it to anyone but who's thirsty for God. If you have the hunger and you have the thirst for God, the Holy Ghost can never work in you. He can never bring some of these great <clears throat> blessings, some of these great treasures into our heart and life until he first can create a deep hunger for God. Brother, sister, these are the days. Oh, these are the days that God is longing for your fellowship, longing for you to come and really pour out your heart to him, to really come into the place where you can find the Lord's presence and really worship him, worship the Lord, let him. I know one time the Lord brought to my mind while I was waiting before him, uh, waiting on him for uh, certain conditions and I said, Lord, I don't seem to feel your presence. What is it? Something between you and me? Lord, I love you. And I was talking to the Lord something like that <clears throat> and all at once it swept over my whole soul. Your thirst has never come like it did to King David with tears with tears. He wept. His pillow was wet with tears. Night and day he poured his heart out. And I said, oh God, it's true. I have not been melted, but I can't melt myself, and I can't break myself, but Lord, I yield to thee. Whatever it takes to bring this brokenness of heart brokenness of spirit, brokenness in me. I want it, Lord. I really mean it. Look in my heart and see. I really want it, no matter what comes. A couple of days after that, a sister came up to me in the church and she said, uh, well, she said, and if everybody was like you, she said, we can all come to church. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, she says, you have no children. She said, I don't suppose you want them, she said. Oh, God. I said, here I prayed for years. I had one child, and the Lord took it, but I never had another. And I wanted to adopt children because I loved them. For her, yes, yeah, she says, that's all right, she says. Uh, oh, God, I said. I got down on my face, and I began to cry, and I said, Lord, is that what people think about me? Yeah, that woman coming up to say that? Why, oh, Lord, that's terrible. What can I say? And the Lord said, didn't you ask me to break you last night? Oh, nothing could have broke me more. Nothing. And every time I see that woman come in the church, she comes and I say, oh, God, have mercy on her soul. Lord, have mercy on her soul. Have mercy on her soul, Lord. Give her repentance, Jesus. Give her repentance. So one day, I saw her come to the altar. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, go down, put your arm around her, pray with her. Oh, go down and pray with her, I thought. She needs to come and apologize to me. Go down and pray with her. So I went down. I went to the altar. I put my arm around her. And the minute I obeyed, put my arm around her, such a love. Oh, such a love, but in my soul. We, I wept.
You see, the Holy Spirit will always tell us. He is faithful, but we are too strong. We don't want to be humble. We don't want to go down. And so what can he do? Go on and on. That woman would probably went up from that altar with the same hardness in her own heart that she'd always had. And I the same judgment in my spirit. But when we two, together, <laughs> but we never had the sweetness of that perfume in our lives because we never found the garden. We never walked in the garden. We just stayed, as it were, the crucified life. And we never got the joy out of that wonderful, marvelous experience crucified with him. I read one time this little uh, message on this little verse. A woman, a minister's wife that had had quite a ministry and, uh, and had everything that uh, comfortable and so forth. And her husband died and she was left alone. She had no children. And after her means was gone and so forth, she had to go and live with her nephew. And uh, his wife was very much against her. Thought she was proud and everything else and she didn't want her. She was first making quite a trouble, but the nephew said there's nothing to do but to take her because after all, she's my aunt and I must provide for when there's nothing. So they moved her things in, but the niece made them go clear into the attic, took them clear in the attic, all her things. And she sent her children up with her meals every day. She didn't want her around. And so the dear soul was terrible lonely. She felt the crushing, the terrible feeling of being up in the attic and alone and not wanted. I don't know if you ever had that experience of not being wanted. It's a lovely experience. Crucified is splendid. Well, one day, one night, and she stood it about as long as she could. Got up in the night and she went to the window. I said that she knelt down in front of the window and she said, Oh, God, something like this. Oh, God, this is too much for me. I can't stand it. Take me, Lord. Lord, I'll just have to do something. I can't stand this. And she said she cried to God and cried to God. For some time, a couple of hours, she stood there by that window looking at the stars and heavens and saying, Oh, if there's a God, why don't you do something for me? Why has he taken my husband? Why has he left this? Why, why? And while she was going through all this, why, why? But when she got through to the end of her why, the Lord came very near to her. And he said to her, you are being crucified. She says, yes, Lord, that's what I am. Way up here, I'm crucified. They're crucifying me, he said. Well, there's a garden there. And she said it went all through her. The Spirit of God was right by her side. He said, there's a garden there, but you haven't found it. Well, I certainly have found no garden. In my field, there's a garden. And there are beautiful flowers in that garden. There's love, and there's peace, and there's joy. Oh, there's wonderful fruit in this garden where our Lord was crucified. Said, garden and crucified? How could it be a garden? Well, that's where it was. She got her Bible to find this scripture. Was it really so? And when she read that scripture in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. She said, Lord, how can I find that garden? And he said to her, Go downstairs in the morning wash the dishes for your niece. Take care of the children. Wipe up the kitchen floor. Oh, I've never done anything. Never. Well, all right. Lord, is that the real is it God? So the next morning she went downstairs. She said to her niece, let me wash the dishes. And the niece looked at her. You wash the dishes? Yes, I want to wash the dishes. So she didn't know what to make of it. 
She had to go out on an errand, and when she came back, she had the dishes all done, she had the floor swept, she had the children all dollared up and fixed. She said, oh, my, oh, my. Next day, she came down again. She helped with the meals. She helped in every way. And then the niece said to her, what has come over you? You're a changed woman. I never knew you were like this. I'll bring all your things down from the attic and put them on the second floor. You don't need to stay up in the attic anymore. She said, no, because I found the garden. I found the garden. I found the garden. Oh, sometimes when we're going through our tests, when we're going through a hard, trying place, let's find the garden. Let's find the garden. And let that rose of shadow become such a living power in your life and let the perfume from the lilies of the valley let it perfume your whole being good morning brother jeffrey greetings to you from the camp meeting or uh, from the convention we've been having a very lovely time here but we missed you terrible this is sister brown and uh, the Lord has been blessing the people here. We've had a lovely time. I have heard about your not being so well. But never mind, these are wonderful days to live with Jesus, aren't they? Days in which you and I are being prepared for the glorious rapture. And so we can just say amen to all the places that the Lord permits us to go through. And so he's letting you go through perhaps some stormy place, but I know that you have found Jesus, the fullness of his blessing. God bless you. We won't forget to pray for you, Brother Jeffries. And uh, the people here have all been praying for you and speaking about you and your ministry. They have never forgotten and never will. And so we're trusting that Jesus will have the very best for you in store in the days to come. God bless you and bless you real good.